Okay, uh, so let's talk a little bit about reconstruction. I'm going to probably make two videos here. One covering presidential reconstruction, one covering radical reconstruction or congressional reconstruction. Uh, now, reconstruction in many ways sums up American history. Uh, this is an opportunity to make a significant change. Unfortunately, little is made. Politics plays a great deal of this, but most important, in my opinion, the history of the United States is the history of compromise. And compromise defines Reconstruction throughout, particularly with the corrupt bargain uh, or the great betrayal, however you want to look at the Compromise of 1877, and that's where we'll kind of end off here. But we'll start here with presidential Reconstruction. Now, of course, Lincoln is assassinated by Booth, uh, and what's somewhat ironic in the situation is that if Lincoln had survived we know that his reconstruction would have been um, it would have been based around welcoming the South back into the Union now of course there would have been penalties etc cetera, etc cetera, but Lincoln was very much magnanimous in victory he wanted to bring the South back in he wanted to begin the healing process and Whereas Johnson was also quite lenient in Reconstruction, it was a different in a different way. He was very much more pro-South because, of course, he's from Tennessee. We're going to get to that here in a minute. Uh, but Lincoln had enough political capital, whereas he could have uh, promoted this more lenient Reconstruction policy and been able to create a much more peaceful transition. So, all right, well, let's get to... Presidential Reconstruction. Again, this uh, this is Andrew Johnson. Uh, and who is Andrew Johnson? Johnson grew up poor, uh, never attended school, uh, started life as a tailor before turning to politics. He learned to read, write, and understand math from his wife, Eliza McCardle Johnson. He would be elected to Congress, act as governor, and even as a U.S. Senator in 1857. His political support came primarily from small-scale farmers and working people. This is significant. Uh, the state's plantation-owning elites did not like him. They generally opposed him. He uh, then would resent their wealth and power and often blame their, them for secession uh, and the Civil War itself. Uh, also notable, he was the only Southern Senator who rejected the Confederacy. Now, when the Union troops captured Nashville early in the war, Johnson would be appointed military governor. He dealt harshly with Tennessee secessionists, particularly the wealthy planters. Of course, this uh, kind of develops a great deal of antipathy from them toward him uh, through Reconstruction and beyond. Um, now, he was made vice president because Lincoln wanted to appeal to Democrats in border states, such as Tennessee, and uh, by bringing him on board, of course, that would garner more support. Now, for all his treatment of wealthy planners in Tennessee, though, Johnson was still very much a states' rights guy. He opposed a strong federal government, um, and his infamous quote is, uh, white men alone must manage the South. For Johnson, Reconstruction was about empowering the region's white middle class and excluding wealthy planters from power. He was bitter. He wanted vengeance, but only on an individual level. His idea was a quick restoration of the southern states to the Union and grant amnesty to most former Confederates if they A, pledged loyalty to the Union, and B, supported emancipation. Now, just on the surface, any of us can look at this and say that is a pretty, uh, that's a pretty low bar <laughs> to create, uh, to welcome these Southerners back in. But that is what Johnson did. He wanted it to be a peaceful uh, process. Uh, and again, very similar to Lincoln in that way. Um, a little bit too lenient, though, in this way, because, of course, anybody could pledge loyalty but not act upon it and people could claim to support emancipation but still do other things uh, and treat African Americans in uh, similarly negative ways so and of course we see this he was inflexible he didn't understand the art of compromise and this would be part of his undoing he expected southern whites to establish new state governments loyal to the Union he would pardon over 7,000 former Confederates he appointed a provisional governor for each former Confederate state to convene, convene constitutional conventions to adopt the 13th Amendment, nullify secession, cancel state debts incurred for prosecution of the war. 
Significantly, many of these constitutional conventions included Confederates. Now, this is something Lincoln would not have allowed. Uh, <clears throat> and provisional governor, governors, for example, appointed former Confederates to state and local offices as well, thereby denying the previous promises of a new Southern society, one that eschewed uh, secession and uh, eschewed the uh, antebellum ways of life in the South. So again, you have many former Confederates part of these constitutional conventions, and these conventions are what are supposed to change Southern society and begin the true process of Reconstruction. By 1866, most states had completed this. Johnson considered Reconstruction complete and recommended those chosen by these governments serve in Congress. Uh, but Okay, sorry. He recommended that these individuals chosen by these state governments to serve in Congress be allowed to take their seats. Johnson's Reconstruction allowed the South to run itself in many ways. He required former Confederates to give an oath of loyalty to protect the 13th Amendment, and if so, he returned all property and rights to them. Again, this is an easy thing to promise, not an easy thing on which to act upon for many of these people. And of course, many agreed with this. They simply wanted to be done with the conflict, and make no mistake, it's not like those in the North were not racist as well, or viewed African Americans as equals. We often get this sense of, you know, Garrison or, or Lincoln or these people being, oh my gosh, they were so ahead of their time. Uh, there were instances of people who did believe in true equality, did believe in true citizenship for African Americans, but for the most part, uh, there's still this sense of uh, the need for distance. And as the old saying goes, many in the North did not want African Americans to be slaves, but they certainly didn't want them to be their neighbors. Now, for some reason, Johnson was surprised that there was no emergence of a new political leadership in the South, uh, that the rich planters and former Confederate officials had won many elections and reinstated the status quo. Uh, now, again, this might point to Johnson's lack of intellect, shall we say, um, his lack of appreciation of the situation or of the lack of understanding of just how lenient he was being. But again, this is what we see. So. This is, again, kind of the uh, outline of presidential reconstruction. And what does presidential reconstruction allow for? Well, if you have this lenient president who is allowing the South very much to dictate its own terms, bring these former Confederates back in, the officials who started the war are now back in society making decisions, well, there's going to be some reaction. Uh, and many of you are already familiar with some of the Southern response. Uh, Johnson's idea of Reconstruction, again, did in fact empower the South again, essentially relegating social realities to the antebellum status quo. States were in charge of themselves, were allowed to dictate relations between the races and the classes. If they had to succumb to abolition, they would not do so lightly, and they came up with various ways in response. Of course, one way would be the black codes uh, that were initiated. Uh, Southerners found different ways to control African Americans and very much through these black codes. For example, they had to provide proof they had a job, uh, and this was in the form of an annual employment contract. If not, they would have to go back to work on the plantations, now not as slaves, but still with very limited options. They had to pay a special tax if they were not farmers or servants. Uh, they were barred from public facilities, uh, limited freedom to move about the countryside without permission, restricted ownership of land. Um, the Freedmen's Bureau, which was established to ease the transition to emancipation, was very much left helpless uh, as these states kind of took power from this federal authority. We also see increasing violence. Again, African Americans, uh, very, even though they are emancipated, uh, were not viewed as equals among many in the South. We have, of course, the Ku Klux Klan, formed in 1866 by former Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest. Uh, Forrest had built up quite the myth around himself during the Civil War, uh, kind, of seen, uh, kind of seen as indestructible, as somebody who could get away from any situation. And he will continue this again after the war with his work uh, leading the KKK. And this was based, uh, it was peopled very much by small-scale farmers, laborers, people who had little control over their lives. And the, par and, and the Ku Klux Klan itself had very little central control. Um, operated with the intent of restoring white supremacy and destroying 
the Republican Party. Now, the KKK, well, of course, there will be a resurgence in the 20th century, and it's a, it's a different KKK, obviously. It's still partly about uh, race, but it is very much about ethnic groups, religion, Jews, Catholics, etc., and the desire to keep those people down. Now, uh, there's also a movie that comes out uh, while Woodrow Wilson is president entitled The Birth of a Nation, and The Birth of a Nation reflects this idea that the KKK came to the rescue of the South after the war. This helps to build up, of course, the myth of the lost cause. There's also an uptick in lynching. Oftentimes, an African-American man would be accused of raping a white woman, and instead of allowing justice to justice to take its course. A group of whites may form a mob, hunt the man down, beat him, hang him, shoot him, set him on fire, and to be sure, blacks were not the only ones lynched, but they did comprise a majority of those lynched. This was a reality well into the 20th century, and even in Omaha in 1919, we have the lynching of Will Brown, which followed this same formula. Uh, probably the most embarrassing incident in uh, our fine city's history. Post-war economics, a few things as well. Uh, few whites welcomed the end of slavery. Uh, fewer still provided any type of financial assistance to their former slaves. And some even tried to keep the truth of emancipation from them. You may have heard the stories where they wouldn't communicate this and people were left on the plantations people maintained as slaves for a short while after the war because they simply weren't informed. Uh, would, they would, of course, eventually be informed things would change. Um, and I want to go back to Tecumseh here. Uh, when Tecumseh marched through Georgia at the end of the war, uh, of course, thousands of African American men, women, and children claimed their freedom, followed the Yankees. In January of 65, Sherman would issue his special order number 15, which set aside the sea islands and land along the South Carolina coast for freed families. Each of these freed families was to receive 40 acres in the loan of an army mule. By June 1865, the area had filled with 40,000 freed people settled on 400,000 acres of what became known as Sherman's Land. Now this is also where we get the uh, phrase 40 acres and a mule. Um, and this again, for Sherman, of course, he sees South Carolina as the reason, not the reason, but they were most at fault as far as initiating the war. So he is more than happy to carve up their land and give it to these freed people. The problem, though, is that this led many African Americans to believe that the federal government would fully redistribute these lands, uh, leading to the rally cry, again, 40 acres and a mule. Radicals in the North agreed. Thaddeus Stevens stated, quote, if we do not furnish them with homesteads, we had better left them in bondage. And there is some truth to this claim um, because what's one of the big issues of the Civil War? What do we do with the slaves after the war? If we just give them their freedom, are we helping them at all? They are left alone. They cannot, they don't have special training, for example. Uh, they do not have jobs waiting for them. They do not have education. They do not have the vote. Um, these are some of the many questions, of course, that define Reconstruction, and we'll, we'll get to some of those when we talk about the radicals in the next a video lecture. Uh, but again, Thaddeus Stevens, one of many who is forward thinking in this way. So by the end of the war, the Freedmen's Bureau controlled some 850,000 acres of abandoned land and confiscated land. Um, in July of 1865, General Oliver O. Howard, O. period Howard, he was an Irish, uh, he was the head of the Freedmen's Bureau. He directed that this land be divided into 40-acre plots given to freed people and to continue along what Sherman had started, but Andrew Johnson gets in the way. He halted this land redistribution, ordered Howard to return the land to its former owners, even land that had already been handed over and settled by other people. This displaced thousands of African Americans who had already taken these lands. So what to do? What do we do with all this potential labor? And what to do with all these lands that could not be worked because of a lack of labor? Because there was so little capital, how would this even be rectified? Sharecropping, of course, comes to the fore. This would dominate uh, large holdings of land. Uh, but owners had no money to pay workers. Meanwhile, many African Americans and poor whites, it is important to recognize, wanted to farm but lacked their own land and had no supplies or money. How to resolve this? Sharecropping meant that an individual, usually the family head, signed a contract with a landowner to rent land as, uh, as a home and a farm, pay a share of the harvest as rent, 
uh, and this rent might amount to a half or even more of the crop if the landlord provided the tools, the seeds, etc. This might sound fine in theory, but uh, there are other issues. Southern farmers, whether they were white or African American, sharecroppers, or owners of small plots, often found themselves indebted to a local merchant who advanced these supplies on credit. In return for credit, they required a lien or a crop lien on the growing crop. Landlords often ran the stores that provided the credit as well and required their tenants to patronize uh, these stores. So sometimes the rent and the debt owed uh, the store would exceed the total value of the harvest. These contracts or crop liens would be automatically renewed if the total debt was not paid up at the end of the year. And thus you can see how this debt would perpetuate itself in many ways. And this would extend to politics until the 1890s. Voting was an open process so anyone could see how an individual voted. If a landlord or merchant advocated a particular candidate, the intimation was that if the individual did not vote according to the landlord or merchant's whim, credit could be cut off or even that family could be evicted. So again, there are different ways that, can, that we see this control come through. Um, and, you know, we've talked a little bit about African Americans, the changes that they face with the black codes, etc. White Southerners also felt the pangs of change in different ways. Um, sometimes as profound as what the newly freed African American felt. They lost all their money. They lost their homes. They lost their property. Various buildings were destroyed and of course many migrated away from the South. And remember most Southerners did not own slaves. Small planters did not own slaves. They could not afford them. So small planters, for example, um, who didn't even have any slaves, but they were still caught up with the Confederacy and may have had their farms raised by Union soldiers or battles fought on their land that destroyed their property. Uh, and this is not to even touch upon Sherman's march and the absolute destruction that it wreaked. So uh, many for these small farmers, you know, they don't, they're not even necessarily in favor of secession, not in favor of the war. They don't own slaves, yet they face the same issues as if they were large planters or had supported the war directly. Many of these small-scale farmers, again, did not support secession, actually welcomed the Union's victory, and they're taking over the South so that they could rebuild it. For most Southerners, though, there was a feeling, uh, as shared by one North Carolinian, who said, quote, the bitterest hatred toward the North. This is obvious when referencing rich planters who lost their cheap labor force, former Confederate leaders who lost their rights and property, etc., but even those with no attachment to slavery or direct connection to the Confederate power chain detested Northerners. Many of these folks detested Northerners because they had completely changed their lives. They wanted a complete return to the antebellum South, which of course means pre-war South, even if it was without slavery. This lamentation and defense of their pre-war lives, of course, would become known as the lost cause of the Confederacy. Very romantic view of how the South was, uh, full of gentlemen, full of ladies, and of course you have some revisionist history in this idea. Well, these slave owners took really good care of their slaves. They were kind of like their parents. Um, they took them from, you know, uh, helped them, help teach them, help modernize them. Um, gave them a place to stay, gave them medicine when they needed it, food, etc., etc., but they were slaves, pure and simple. So this lost cause remains with us today. Uh, there are a handful of modern southern rock bands who uh, kind of incorporate this sense into their music, Leonard Skinner, of course, being one. Uh, so the lost cause has not died. And this is part of a much larger issue. Uh, with some of the recent scholarship on historical memory and the Civil War. And one of the questions that some uh, historians ask is, how did the South win over the minds of Americans and convince them that, for example, the war was about states' rights or economic freedom rather than about slavery? Why do we see this sense of uh, rem positive reminiscence about the South, about the Confederacy, uh, why do we view the South in positive terms, even though they initiated the bloodiest war we've ever fought? So a lot of things to consider here. We'll kind of move past that. So that is presidential reconstruction, some of the reactions, some of the impact that it had. Uh, next, we will get to radical reconstruction. And when we start that, we'll talk about some of the questions that needed to be answered.